Good evening. Uh, welcome to our third in a third in a series of music evenings from the Library of the Jewish Theological Seminary. We're so excited to have Hazan David Tillman talk to us about Jewish music connections and Leonard Bernstein. Before we begin, let me just remind you to please mute and also remind you that next week we're having a very exciting program about uh, the music of the Abu Yudaya uh, people in Uganda. So we're, please be sure to sign up for that program as well. Just to start, Leonard Bernstein needs no introduction. Tonight, we're fortunate to have Hazan David Tillman speak specifically about the Jewish aspects of Bernstein's work. Hazan Tillman is a graduate of Columbia College, JTS, and the Juilliard School and holds a doc honorary doctorates from both Gratz College and JTS. He served as the Chazan Emeritus at Bet as, as the Chazan at Bet Shalom Congregation in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania for 36 years and was music director at multiple Camp Ramaz. He taught at JTS Cantoria School and is choral director of the Congregation Knesset Israel where in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, where he also serves as pastoral outreach professional. He has conducted and lectured and sung in Europe and even in Havana, Cuba and Santiago, Chile. Currently, Hazan Tillman is conductor of the Delaware Valley Cantor's Assembly Ensemble. He has presented at Verizon Hall in Philadelphia, lecturing on various works of Bernstein and performing works of Bernstein in conjunction with the Bernstein Centennial. He is now music director of the Sing Hallelujah Concert Series at Verizon Hall. Uh, Hazan Tillman also served as a creative consultant for the Bernstein Centennial exhibit mounted by the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia. Please join me in welcoming Hazan Tillman. I know you're in for a real treat of wonderful music and wonderful stories. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Naomi. I'm truly honored to be here this evening talking about uh, Maestro Leonard Bernstein of blessed memory. Leonard Bernstein was born in 1918, died in 1990 at the very young age, relatively of 72 years old. And throughout the world, throughout the world from 2016 to 2018, there was a three year centennial celebration of the music of Leonard Bernstein. Now, Leonard Bernstein, we know, was one of the great, maybe the greatest of the 20th century eclectic musicians. He did many, many things at a time when musicians only specialized in one thing. He was a conductor par excellence, a superb composer, a superb pianist, and a fantastic music educator. And for the purposes of our discussion tonight, he was Jewish through to the essential core of his being. And his Jewishness, which he lived and experienced all his life, is revealed in a large number of his compositions. There are scholars who point to at least 20, 20 examples of Maestro Bernstein's Jewish use of Jewish musical motives, motifs, his drawing in from the experiences that he internalized during his childhood and his teenage years growing up in Boston. And of those 20 works that have Jewish musical sources and Jewish musical elements in them, I divide them into really three categories. There are musical examples of his works that are overtly Jewish, that were designed and directed to the Jewish community at large. That's category one. Then there are then there are musical sources and musical examples where the Jewish music is there clearly, clearly and 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 uh, the essential component in these pieces. But these pieces are designed for a broader audience and provide the the major uh, source of his of his musical output. And then there are places where the Jewish musical ingredients are somewhat hidden and somewhat humorous and somewhat almost devious. 
uh, we have to look a little harder to find them. And when we do, we are certainly very, very surprised. And it'll be my agenda this evening to point out examples of Bernstein's musical output that show all of these three categories. Where were we? Where were all of us? Where were all of you when we first became aware of Leonard Bernstein? Now, in my case, I wish to tell you that I became aware of Mer Leonard Bernstein as a young boy. I think I was maybe 10 years old. And I remember that in January of 1958, Mr. Bernstein appeared on C the Columbia Broadcasting Network on CBS, beginning a series that ran for over 20 years called the Young People's Concerts. And he was already the music director of the New York Philharmonic, and but his desire to be a musical educator caused him to come out to uh, accumulate for himself a group of writers and producers at uh, the CBS network to produce these young people's concerts. Now, they transformed my life. They changed my life. I will tell you that at that point, at my young age, of his Jewishness I'm unaware of, and it didn't really mean much to me. But I will say that my awareness of a conductor up to that point was conditioned by the fiery Italian Arturo Toscanini, who was hot-tempered, wore a big black coat, had long white hair, and that was what I thought a conductor looked like. And on the TV screen appears this young man, educated in the United States, trained at Harvard University, at Curtis Institute of Music here in Philadelphia, and at Tanglewood, the summer home of the Boston Symphony. Now, other people would say, I became aware of Leonard Bernstein, through West Side Story, and that points to his eclecticism, to the fact that not only did he compose serious music, classical music, but he composed music for the Broadway stage, and he was profoundly successful at that. And West Side Story, which was written in 1957, really made him, really made him an international star. And people who know nothing else of Leonard Bernstein's music know all the golden hits of West Side Story. And as a composer of popular musical theater, he expanded our harmonic palette by using all kinds of very interesting and demanding chords and musical structures that, that, that he made very popular and very moving and very profoundly influential on our tastes. So it was the Young People's Concerts and the, and the show West Side Story that brought Leonard Bernstein to the forefront of our consciousness. His early youth is certainly well known. And let me just hit the highlights here. He grew up in Brookline, Massachusetts in an Orthodox Jewish home. His father wanted to be sure that he, that he would make, be, be exposed to a Jewish environment that was more palatable than the Orthodox home in which he grew up. And so they joined a conservative congregation, Mishkan Tfila, where he was exposed to a magnificent music director whose name was Professor Braslavsky. And the music of Professor Braslavsky totally captivated Leonard Bernstein. And he gave an interview toward the end of his life in 1989, where he said, I felt something stir within me in those early years at Mishkan Tfila. He had a fabulous cantor. Then the organ would start and the choir would begin and I began to get crazed. And that was Bernstein's initial exposure to the Jewish music of the Jewish people as interpreted by the work of Professor Brazlovsky. Now, as a very young man, as a very young man, he began composing and already, already in 1942, he had written a small piece, which, we, which was called a Hebrew melody. The Boston Symphony, the Boston Symphony had a competition for new and creative works for full symphony orchestra. And Maestro Bernstein took that movement, the Hebrew melody, and that became the third movement of what then morphed into the Jeremiah Symphony. He wrote movement one and he wrote movement two. 
and entered it into this competition. It did not win the prize offered by the Boston Symphony Orchestra, but it, it drew the attention of William Steinberg in the Pittsburgh Symphony, who loved the piece and asked Maestro Bernstein as a very young man to come to Pittsburgh and debut the piece. As soon as the director, music director, uh, conductor Kusevitsky heard that in Boston, he said, okay, we should have it in Boston as well. And Mr. Bernstein's career as a composer was born. So it is my, my intention now to look at the Jeremiah Symphony, particularly the second movement of that Jeremiah Symphony. But before we do, we have to prepare our oral palette, our oral palette. And let's do so by singing the, the, the blessings before we recite a Haftarah. Those of us who go to synagogue with any regularity know that every Shabbat, and every holiday, we recite portions from the prophetic literature. And the prophetic literature has a certain musical signature, a certain musical motif, Haftarah trope. The, the musical signs and symbols sung in the signature uh, style of the Haftarah trope. And we, we can hear those notes if we sing the blessings before the Haftarah as follows. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bachar B'Nevi'im Etovim now that we have that in our ear, I want you to do a second step with me and let us take that same melody and turn it in, into a nigun, into a wordless melody. So we'll sing those haftarah cantillations on la. La 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 Our third and final tuning of our consciousness is to take that nigun now and sing it very, very fast as follows. La 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 Listen now and see what Maestro Bernstein does with that musical signature in the second movement entitled Profanation of his Jeremiah Symphony. So I hope you could hear that that comes directly, that movement came directly from uh, the Haftorah Trap, very, very obviously a reflection of Mr. Bernstein's youthful uh, experiences at Mishkan Tfila, where he heard Haftarot every Shabbat. He took the Trap, he took the, the musical motifs of the Haftarah and made that the second movement of the Jeremiah Symphony. We're now going to go a few years later 
when Mr. Bernstein is now in New York and uh, is beginning to achieve significant fame as a conductor and as a composer. And on the east side of Manhattan, at 50 East 87th Street, is a wonderful congregation, in many ways the flagship of the conservative movement to this day, and that's the Park Avenue Synagogue. I had the privilege of beginning my own professional career there as the Chazan Sheni at the Park Avenue Synagogue, and the Chazan Rishon was Chazan David J. Putterman, David Yosef Ben Yisrael Moshe, Zichron Olivracha, blessed memory. Cantor Putterman began a very, very unique program of commissioning composers, of hiring composers, paying them a fee and asking them to write a piece for his services at the Park Avenue Synagogue. The leadership of the congregation supported that with great uh, energy and great uh, effort and put up the necessary funds for that. And Cantor Putterman had the unique ability of securing the work of composers who before they really became famous. And he would then turn around and say, well, he wrote for me first. And so was the case with Leonard Bernstein. Uh, Cantor Putterman asked Leonard Bernstein in 1945 to write a setting of Hashkivenu, grant that we lie down in peace, secure in that protecting love, et cetera, in the Friday night service right before the Amidah. This piece is dated 1945, and uh, it is written for Cantor Putterman, who was a lyric tenor and professional choir and organ. It's a very difficult piece to present, uh, would only be presented in our day and age in a concert situation, not particularly in a synagogue situation. It's very, very much a la Bernstein, and Bernstein, to my awareness, followed the very careful three sections of the Hashkivenu. Every Hashkivenu setting that we know has a pastoral beginning, a fiery middle, re remove from us pestle and sword, famine and sorrow, and then a pastoral uh, decapo, a pastoral ending uh, recapitulation. So here is just a couple of sections, a couple of measures from the Bernstein Hashkivenu written for the Park Avenue Synagogue in 1945. There's Bernstein at that time. And here's the piece. spread over us the tabernacle of peace. This is still the pastoral section. Now the fiery meat. That's all we have time for. This is the uh, the evening of that premiere. And this is a, 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 an eight by 10 picture. You can see it's dated and that's Putterman's handwriting that I recognize very, very well. Friday, May 11th, 1945. World premiere performance, Hashkiveno by Leonard Bernstein and the three principal people for that performance. There is Maestro Bernstein on the left of the, of the Shulchan is looked at that time, Cantor Putterman in the middle, and to the right of Cantor Putterman, um, to the left of Cantor Putterman, to the right of our picture, was the person that conducted the service, and that's the great American Jewish composer, Max Helfman, who was for many years the choral director at the Park Avenue Synagogue. Those are the principles involved in the, in the writing of the Bernstein Hashkivenu. We're now going to look at the first theater piece that we want to look at tonight. And that is Candide, Candide based on 
the uh, the work by Volt uh, by uh, uh, by the, the work Candide um, by Voltaire and um, uh, Bernstein wrote this in many ways it, he was never satisfied with his versions of of uh, of Candide he rewrote it at least three times but what caught my eye was this particular piece this is in Bernstein's original handwriting. Uh, from the original score, and there's a piece in the show called Old Ladies Jewish Tango. That was Bernstein's name of the piece. It is called now I Am Easily Assimilated, which is a very, very interesting title, but Bernstein originally called it Old Ladies Jewish Tango, and if you look at the left, if you look at the left at the tempo marking, it says Moderato Hasidicamente, Moderato Hasidicamente. He wanted it in a moderate speed as a Hasidic dance, as, as a Hasidic hopke. Uh, uh, and that's what he got. That's what he got. And that's what he got from the, the, uh, from the performance that I'm going to play for you. This is just a little bit of I Am Easily Assimilated, uh, sung by Krista Ludwig from Candide. So much for I am easily assimilated or old ladies Jewish tango. We put this piece really in the third category of the three I mentioned in the beginning, a, a piece where the Jewish content is rather hidden, but nevertheless with a little bit of research becomes very, very obvious and very, very evident. Now we're going to go to the famous West Side Story. West Side Story has a very interesting Jewish history, which most people don't know about. It is brought out very clearly in the Bernstein biographies, of which the most famous is uh, a book by Humphrey Burton. Humphrey Burton is the definitive Bernstein biography. And apparently Bernstein was very taken with the idea of setting to music a Romeo and Juliet story in, in a contemporary milieu, a contemporary milieu. And he wanted originally to write a piece called East Side Story. Fe featuring a battle between teenage Jews and teenage Puerto Ricans under the FDR drive. Uh, his producers at the time, his backers at the time, thought that, that it would not work, would not fly, would never sell tickets. So East Side Story under the FDR drive moved to the West Side Story under the West Side Highway. Um, uh, and instead of being young Orthodox Jews, it became Italians and Puerto Ricans. But a couple of the Jewish elements that were originally designed in that show stayed. Now, here we are, we're going to do another little vocal exercise. And uh, we all go, those of us who go to synagogue, certainly on Rosh Hashanah, we know the sound of the shofar, tekiat shofar. We know when on, the, on Rosh Hashanah, uh, the, the, uh, the rabbi yells out, Tikiya, and the chauffeur blower goes, ba ba ba. Da -da -dum. That's we know we know that tikiya. I would like you even to try that. Everybody in the privacy of your own living rooms, um, don't be afraid, but sing a tikiya again. Tikiya, and sing it with me. Da da -da so having heard that and having that sound fresh in our ear, let's listen to this piece called Symphonic Dances from West Side Story, which are excerpts from the show. But listen to how it begins.
So I hope you heard that tekiah at the very, very beginning. First three notes. First three notes. Ba -ba -ba in the show, in the prologue, West Side Story doesn't have a traditional overture. It has what is called in the score a prologue. And in the prologue is the, is the music setting the scene for when the jets come on stage. And in the score, in the orchestral writing of the score, every time a member of the Jets comes on stage, he comes on stage to the sound of tequila. It sounds from the French horns, from the trumpets, from the trombones in the orchestra, uh, tequila as clear as can be. As a, in another place where the tequila is, um, Tony calls a meeting of all the Jets and he pulls out from his back pocket a, a, a boatswain's whistle and he goes with his whistle Again, it's the tequila sound that Bernstein used again and again. And again, this is the third example the, in the third category of Jewish musical elements that are a surprise, a surprise and unknow unknown to us. So that so I wanted to put that out there for your appreciation. Next time you hear that record, that wonderful original uh, Broadway score, to uh, original Broadway cast recording to West Side Story. You'll hear that tequila and you'll know from whence it came, from whence it came. We go now to an arrangement, an arrangement. Now, an arrangement is not an original composition. An arrangement is where someone asked Maestro Bernstein to write uh, a piece of music that he did not write but to arrange it for a particular purpose. Now, uh, we we're going back a few years to 1950 or 51 or 52. Bernstein, as a very young man, was asked by a dancer whose name was Corinne Hochem to write an arrangement of this tune, which you see in front of you. Matet Yahu Shelem was an Israeli composer, a very successful Israeli composer, and he wrote a tune, a popular tune called Simchuna. Let us rejoice. This is the lead sheet from Mordechai, from Matichahu Shelem's songbook and the opening measures. If you can read it with me, do it, and I'll sing it for you. Simchu na simchu na ufirku haol, chag lanu v'simcha yom lanu gadol. Me'ayin yatsarnu yesh, yadzorea v'choresh, zela v'tsuretan, ma'yim shefarav natan, oz oz ma'vachoach. Ur ur hitoshesh tochma galgoesh shme abor va amol hozruchenu bal yipol ura ura ur 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 ura wake up wake up wake up rejoice rejoice and take off the 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 all the yoke the yoke of of our galut mentality because today is a yom lanu gadol we have a great day so Mr Bernstein took this tune and arranged it for a dance group and he wrote it for a group called the Pacific Symphonetta and Chorus and it was recorded on an album called Four Horror Dances conducted by the film composer Victor Young in a 78 RPM recording. Unfortunately the original score was lost. It's lost. The only record we have of this is in fact the recording. So a wonderful composer in New York whose name was Ruvain Kosakov in 1954 took that recording and he then notated it. He wrote the music listening to the recording many times and then the choral version became very, very popular amongst all the Jewish choruses, the sophisticated and disciplined Jewish choruses. This is what the choral arrangement looks like. Uh, Matit Shalem arranged by Leonard Bernstein and I'll, I have the whole performance here and we'll listen to it a little bit. Oh, 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 oh,
third statement of the tune. couple of points to make there. Obviously, it, its source as a piece written for a dance group was very apparent. The rhythm never deviates. Straight ahead, bum, 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 which dancers need, a very straight ahead rhythm. Uh, I was very taken by the fact that in this, in the lyric, there's a phrase that says, may ayin yatsarnu yesh, from nothing we created something, which in the context of the original Matijahu Shalom song, talking about Medina Yisrael, the state of Israel. Bernstein, I think, took that phrase very literally in a musical way. From a simple tune, he created this rather intensely interesting contrapuntal um, uh, and harmonic uh, arrangement of this hora. And there are polyrhythms there. It's, there's a measures of sixes, measures of fours, measures of twos. And uh, uh, he, he did a terrific job of arranging someone else's material. Now this goes into that first category of music that Bernstein wrote for and express, expressively and expressly for the Jewish community. Another piece to, like that is the next one, is the next one. And this is a children's piece, a children's piece, a setting of Yigdal. Now in 1950, 1950, 1950, the United Synagogue Commission on Jewish Education published this really seminal book. I'll hold it up for you. It's long, long out of print, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. It's called The Songs We Sing, Lishonenu Rina. The editor, you can see down at the bottom, is Mr. Harry Coopersmith, who served for many, many years as the music director of what had been called the Board of Jewish Education many, many, many years ago. Literally more than a half a century ago, 70 years ago, um, a long, long time ago. And, and uh, Mr. Coopersmith got to Hutterman, and who was the who was a, uh, an official in at, at JTS, and I think Putterman got to Bernstein, and from that comes this setting of Yigdal, uh, the opening couple of lines of Yigdal. It is written as what we call in music a canon, C A N O N, around, around. And um, uh, if we look at this music, uh, and I'll, let me sing the opening lines, the opening measures for you. You, we go line one, and then and then the line one at the top, which is one, and then we go down to the second bar, second system for the rest of the, of the first phrase, and then we go back to number two, echad, and we sing the second line of the second phrase of the second system, and then the same thing with the third phrase. Yigdal Elohim Chai ve'yishtabach nimso v'yein es. It's written for children, really. Uh, sophisticated children, sophisticated teenagers who are wonderful singers and can do all these accidentals here, these these uh, these 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 uh, flatted notes, and um, and that was Mr. Bernstein's contribution to Lishonenu Rina, to the songs we sing, published by the United Synagogue in 1950. Here it is. <laughs>
wonderful performance by the uh, Hazamir, the International Jewish High School Choir, uh, conducted by its uh, founder and, and music director, longtime music director, uh, Mati uh, Lazar, the, uh, the longtime conductor of the Zamir Chorale, and a brilliant, uh, really wonderful performance of a very hard piece, the uh, Bernstein Yigdal. Now, again, that's back in category number one, pieces written for the Jewish community to be consumed and enjoyed by the Jewish community, by uh, Mr. Bernstein. I want to just call your attention briefly to some pieces for which I will not play any music for you. Uh, of course, uh, maybe his most famous of the Jewish oriented pieces is the Chichester Psalms, written in 1963, commissioned by the, uh, the Chichester, Chichester Abbey outside of London for the 500th anniversary of that abbey. And Mr. Bernstein took a collection of Hebrew psalms and wrote a wonderful choral piece. Actually, it's the music is, is a little bit based on a piece. Mr. Bernstein had written a Broadway show that did not succeed, that did not succeed. And so he pulled music from that, from his drawer, from his show that did not succeed and adapted much of that music for the Chichester Psalms, for the Chichester Psalms. And, uh, and uh, uh, every Jewish chorus sings the Chichester Psalms. That may be the most widely performed uh, of, of Mr. Bernstein's pieces because it's performed all over the world. It, for, it is joyous, wonderful, exciting music, and it is short, really. The whole piece is three movements of 18 minutes total. Of course, the other piece that, uh, the piece that also emanates from, from that period is called the Kaddish Symphony. And here's the original album. I want to make sure you can see it. The Kaddish Symphony written in, uh, it was originally dedicated to his father, but then right before its premiere, uh, the Kaddish Symphony uh, was rededicated to the memory of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, uh, with whom Mr. Bernstein had a long, and Jackie, uh, uh, and, and Jackie Kennedy, with whom Mr. Bernstein and his wife, Felicia Montenegro, had a long-term uh, social uh, relationship. And in memory of John F. Kennedy, he write, wrote the Kaddish Symphony, which is a statement of Mourner's Kaddish, three or four different statements of Mourner's Kaddish. And in reality to it is also a statement of Bernstein's own theology at that time of his life. Uh, based on Jewish sources, it goes through the Mourner's Kaddish three full times with all kinds of English tropes between the statement of the Kaddish. Very, very powerful piece, intensely detailed. Um, I have, uh, I, I wanted to mention from the beginning that that my uh, my own conducting teacher was the great uh, is the great he's very much alive and uh, although he's 90 years old but still very hale and hearty Mr. Abraham Kaplan an Israeli born and raised in the, in the Tel Aviv and Mr. Kaplan was the choral director for for this album uh Camarada Singers Abraham Kaplan director and was the uh, director of choral activities at the Juilliard school and was my teacher when I was privileged to to study with him for four years and learned a lot about Bernstein's music from my interaction with uh, Mr. Kaplan. I'm now going to go to what may be the most uh, controversial piece on this program today. And this is a piece entitled Mass, M-A-S-S, -S, colon, a theater piece from, for singers, dancers, and players. We're now up to 1971. Mr. Bernstein is 53 years old. He is asked now by Jacqueline Kennedy to, first uh, Jackie asks uh, Mr. Bernstein if he wants to be executive director of the newly commissioned and newly being built John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, DC. And, uh, and Bernstein says, no, so I'm a musician, I'm a conductor and I'm a composer and I'm not certainly an administrator. So I don't wanna be, the executive director of the president of the Kennedy Center. And then he offers, he says, I will write you a piece. I will write you a piece. So he sits down, takes six months or so to work on this piece that he calls Mass, a theater piece for singers, dancers, and players. He reaches a writer's block. He's unable to finish it. His Bernstein's sister, is a theatrical agent and one of her clients is the young 
composer Stephen Schwartz, who we know now is the composer of Wicked and Pippin and so many shows. Um, uh, Stephen Schwartz uh, had a, uh, a show um, on, on, on Off-Broadway in 1971 based on the New Testament. And uh, his Bernstein's sister said, go see that show. Go see that show. Bernstein went to see the show. He met Stephen Schwartz and he took Stephen Schwartz as a collaborator for the Bernstein Mass. With Schwartz's help, uh, Bernstein he was able to finish uh, Mass in time for its premiere. Now, the word Mass is a little bit of a misnomer because it is not really a statement of the Roman Catholic um, service, although the service is in there. The, the piece is long. It takes two hours and 35 or 40 minutes. Um, it's written in a show style. It's a lot of individual numbers, a lot of individual numbers. When it was done in Philadelphia uh, two or three years ago, uh, they had close to 350 performers. The entire Philadelphia orchestra, a children's choir, an adult choir, the Temple University concert band, the Mummers band, a rock band, all kinds of things were going on in the mass. Um, there are people who think that the mass is a work of profound genius and I um, love the piece. Burton says it is the closest he ever came to achieving a total synthesis between Broadway and the concert hall. That's from Burton's uh, biography of Mr. Bernstein. I remember vividly when the piece was originally performed in New York City and then moved, in, in, in Washington rather and then they brought the performance to to the Metropolitan Opera in the summer of 1972. And some of the critics panned it terribly, panned it terribly. I remember one of the critics in the New York, New York media called it Bernstein's mess, M-E-S-S. -S. Uh, people didn't like it. They didn't like the fact that it was, again, to use this significant word, eclectic. It was rock and roll. It was folk music. It was gospel. It was 12 tone, eight tonal music. It was, it was theatrical music, music of all kinds. But the piece has held up very, very well. And I feel that there are some very strong Jewish elements in the piece. And that's what I want to show you right now. So we're going to go first to um, the Sanctus, which is the second part of the mess. Sanctus is the Latin for Kedusha, the Kedusha from the from our Shacharit or Mustaf service, the prayer of sanctification, the third bracha in the Amidah is then translated into Latin and becomes Sanctus, the second section of the Catholic Mass. So in, in the Sanctus of the Bernstein Mass comes these Hebrew sections. Kadosh, 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 Adonai Sivaot, Maloch, Kolo, Ares, Kivodo. Just the way we have those words in the Kedusha in, in, in the uh, Shabbat morning and festival morning service. And then that's followed by Baruch Haba, B'Shem Adonai. This is a performance in London at, the, at what's called the London Prom series of concerts.
Kadosh, 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 Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai, from the Sanctus of the Bernstein Mass. Now, we go now to another movement in the Mass, which happens three quarters of the way through. The Mass, there is a star of the Mass, and that is a man who gives, is given the title celebrant. Now, the celebrant is, can be understood in three ways. He is either a simple parish priest, uh, or he's a, uh, a Jesus figure, or he's Bernstein himself. And um, the, the celebrant preaches a certain kind of simplistic approach to God and to God's revelation to the people around him. And the people take that revelation and make it more and more and more and more complex. And the people develop great anger toward the celebrant. This all comes to a dramatic and mental highlight, or I should, have, should I say low light, because the celebrant suffers clearly a mental breakdown after he gets yelled at by all the people around him. Uh, this piece is climaxes in a very wonderful dramatic moment that we'll talk about after you see it. And the, 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 the choirs get very loud and very noisy and the language is almost incomprehensible, which I think is part of the point, which I think is part of the point. So here is this Dona Nobis Pachem, which by the way, Dona Nobis Pachem is Sim Shalom, Tova Avracha, grant us peace in Latin. And then watch what happens at the end of the Dona Nobis Pachem. And that's what I'm, what I'm aiming for. The celebrant is right here, right here. And you'll see what happens with him at the end of this piece. <laughs>
Now, I remember when I saw that. First of all, what's the word he's yelling, screaming? He's screaming the word pachem, which means shalom. Screaming the word peace when he, because the people are so angry at him, the people are so angry at him, he takes the chalice. He takes the chalice and he does as Moshe Rabbeinu does. He smashes them on the ground like Moshe Rabbeinu smash, smashes the Shnei Luchot Abrit, the two uh, table, t- tablets of, of Shnei Luchot Abrit, the two tablets of the covenant. I'm on, I'm on my own here on this. I've never seen this written anywhere, but I remember feeling that way when I saw this happen on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera in 1972 and, and every succeeding performance of the of mass that I've seen, I feel more strongly that uh, Bernstein took the color, the climate of um, the book of Shemot and the drama surrounding the writing of the uh, of the of the Aseret Hadibrot and bringing them down off of the mountain after 40 days and 40 nights and seeing the people dance in circles around uh, and having Moshe Rabbeinu in utter anger smash the tablets just the way the celebrant here smashes the chalice. Now there is another um, 50 or so minutes of the mass to go after this point and it does have a quasi happy ending at the end of this piece but a very very dramatic piece and a very amazing piece and I did see it and had the privilege of speaking about it uh, when the Philadelphia Orchestra performed it about three or four years ago. I want to conclude with a personal story. I'm going to stop the share now so I can look you right in the eye here. I want to, uh, I want to um, uh, tell you a story that happened to me in 1986. In 1986, um, Bernstein was four years before his death. He was about to, uh, uh, he was 68 years old. He died when he was 72. He came to Philadelphia. He came to Philadelphia to celebrate the 65th, I believe, was anniversary of the Curtis Institute. And the Curtis Institute brought back their their most honored alumnus, uh, Leonard Bernstein, for a month or so of concerts and events. And um, Bernstein conducted the Chichester Psalms in the Academy of Music with the orchestra and the chorus of the Curtis Institute. And I was uh, simultaneously preparing a performance of the Chichester Psalms at Beth Shalom Congregation five or six weeks after that date. So I arranged to go to the, to the rehearsal, to the, to the rehearsal at the Academy. And I took some of my singers with me and we sat through the first half of the run through. And I remember feeling at the time that Bernstein looked old and tired and uh, rather haggard actually and rather dissipated and it was only four years before he died and uh, he went through the first half of the rehearsal and then was a break 15-20 minute break and uh, I went backstage with a couple of my singers and he was all by himself leaning up against the wall all by himself leaning up against the wall I went over to him and I introduced him myself to him I extended my hand and hand and I said maestro my name is David Tillman. I had been uh, Putterman's Chazan Sheni, whom he knew well at the Park Avenue Synagogue. And, uh, and I'm preparing a, a performance of the Chichester Psalms. And, and I pulled out my score, my orchestral score. And Maestro Bernstein autographed the score for me without even thinking, without my asking, he just autographed the score. And he said to me, he, he was very, 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 very thoughtful and very charming. And he said, he was about, you know, on television, he looked to be a very, a, a large man, but he wasn't really. He was only maybe an inch or two uh, taller than me, and uh, which is not really tall at all. And um, he said to me, of course, uh, you're doing the smaller version, aren't you? And let me explain what that means. The Chichester Psalms exists in two versions. The actual score, the 18 and a half minutes of the piece is the same, but the first version for which he wrote for the premiere and for then, which was done by the New York Philharmonic, which is done all over the all, done all over the world, is for the, for the for a large orchestra, strings, uh, uh, a lot of percussion, 
a lot of brass, not no woodwinds in that orchestra. It takes five or six percussion players to do it. It's a loud, brassy, noisy orchestra. Then realizing that the piece could not be performed that way by at synagogues or churches, he wrote a new accompaniment. The new accompaniment is for virtuoso pipe organ, one percussion player, and one harp, which made the piece much more accessible and more economic to present the piece in that way. And, um, and that's what he meant when he said to me, he said, of course, you're doing the, the smaller version, aren't you? And I said, Maestro, no, I, I, uh, I managed to uh, raise the funny funds and the congregation that supported this venture, and I'm going to do the full large version for full orchestra. When I said that to him, he took his hands and he grabbed my face with both hands and he rubbed my cheeks like that. And he went, Atta boy, just like that. And um, it was quite the moment. I didn't shave or wash my face for about four days afterwards. Uh, I do have the score uh, uh, in our safe deposit box of uh, Mr. Bernstein's signature on my score of the Chichester Psalms. Uh, I told that story in 2016 at a luncheon that was given here in, in, in Philadelphia at the National Museum of American Jewish History, at which were attended were, were about a hundred some odd people all describing what they, everybody was planning to do for the Bernstein Centennial. And present at that luncheon were uh, Bernstein's daughter, uh, Jamie, and his son, Alexander. And I told the story and at a boy, just like that. And at that moment, Alexander, Bernstein's son jumped to his feet and he said, that's just what father would have done. And everybody cheered and applauded and laughed. And I viewed that moment as his blessing, his bracha to me. And that was my mandate, which I received from him on that day to keep him alive through the performance and study of his works, especially the Jewish themed ones. I would not call Leonard Bernstein a shomer mitzvot um, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but he was such a passionate and vivid and vital Jew, new Hebrew, new biblical Hebrew, new modern Hebrew, um, very big supporter of the state of Israel, which I didn't even get into today. That's for another, another topic. And, um, and he left so much of his Jewish neshama out there for all of us to internalize and inhale and appreciate. And uh, I extend that blessing to all of you. We uh, should treasure the, the, the output and the life of Mr. Bernstein, and we have to keep him alive through the performance and study of all of his music. From that moment, I will say to Daraba, and I'm glad to hear from you and, our, and Naomi and whatever questions you have. Thank you so, so much, uh, David. This was spectacular. I see by the number of people who who on it and stayed on it, everybody was completely engaged. I urge all the participants to put their questions in the chat and I will moderate the chat. Um, let me start with one question. Um, did Bernstein ever speak or write about the Jewish elements of his secular work. So exa the example that you gave of the Tekiat Shofar in, um, in West Side Story or other examples similar to that. A little bit, uh, a little bit, you know, particularly, I remember reading an article about the, about the, about the, about the, um, the Jeremiah, the Trump, the Jeremiah. And he kind of, he, he didn't, um, he didn't, I won't say he denied it, but he said, well, I, I, I tapped into my youth, youthful memories. It was kind of the spirit of the moment. He didn't go into great detail. He didn't want to, didn't want to particularly acknowledge that. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I wrote I didn't do anything like that, but, but, but he certainly didn't deny it overtly. He didn't deny it overtly, but, but people question about it again, because it's, it's so obvious. It's so evident in so many, in so many cases. Um, I am getting lots and lots of comments that this was fabulous. It was wonderful. They enjoyed it so much. Um, I'm not getting lots of questions about Bernstein and his work. Um, could you say a few things about, I know he was a very strong Zionist. I know that he was the first to conduct the Israel Philharmonic at, um, 
on Mount Scopus after the Six Day War, and uh, a little bit about his connections to Israel. Well, um, he, he, his relationships with with the Israel Philharmonic were were of, of long term, long term. Uh, he was not the first conductor of the of the Israel Philharmonic. In fact, it, there's a wonderful movie, the name of which escapes me right now, about the about the history of the of the Israel Philharmonic when it was the Palestine Philharmonic, and and they. Um, uh, Bronislav first conductor was Toscanini, was Arturo Toscanini, as a matter of fact, who was brought in by, by, by um, was it Braverman or something? I forget the name Bronislav of it. Bronislav Huberman. Huberman, it, right, right, Huberman, it, right. There's a wonderful documentary about him, yes. Right, right, yes. Who, brought, who brought in Toscanini to, uh, to conduct and form the Palestine, uh, the Palestine Philharmonic. But um, before statehood uh, and right after statehood, uh, Bernstein ran to Israel in 1948 um, and there are these these vi these films and still pictures of Bernstein conducting the orchestra, uh, sitting uh, on like sand dunes and sitting on top of tanks in the desert. Uh, and he conducted the orchestra in 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 that situation. Of course, the one you referred to uh, before uh, was in was after the Six Day War in 1967. And there's a movie of that version of that as well. When when Bernstein uh, uh, right after the Six Day War. Two or three weeks after the Six Day War, he he made it made his way into Jerusalem. Um, there's in the, there's a, a, a documentary there too of he of him and Isaac Stern going up to the Kotel Hama Aravi, and uh, Bernstein is wearing a kippah. Uh, Isaac Stern puts on a kippah and they say a prayer. They put a fiddle into the cracks, and um, uh, and then the concert took place. The concert took place on Mount Scopus. Mount Scopus was reopened for the first time in, uh, in, in 19 years. In, in, and and the, the Israel Philharmonic performed there with a large chorus. Uh, they did uh, Hatikva um, in a passionate, passionate performance of Hatikva, slow and moving, intense performance of Hatikva. And, um, and then they did uh, uh, Mahler, the Mahler Resurrection. Uh, piece was the dominant piece. I think Isaac Stern played the Mendelssohn um, uh, violin concerto as well, and uh, they did the the uh, the Mahler Resurrection Symphony in Hebrew, in Hebrew. Uh, Jenny Terrell, who was uh, Bernstein's favorite mezzo soprano, in fact learned to sing the person Hebrew with an Israeli large chorus, and uh, very very popular and very powerful. And Bernstein made his way back to Israel many, many times, as long as he had the strength, uh, uh, strength to, to, to do so, to do so. So Lisa asks, did Bernstein ever write any pieces with Yiddish lyrics? Not that I'm aware, not that I'm aware. He wrote a cup, there's a, there's a, I think a piece called something like Jubilee Dances or something like that, which has some overtly klezmer music in it. Um, uh, in it that, that that's that's great fun, uh, that's great fun. But that but that's strictly instrumental. Uh, with those with those klezmer licks. There's no there's no Yiddish language in 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 there that that, that I'm aware of. The the person that would know about that is Zalman Mlatik, who uh, okay. Zalman Zalman studied with uh, with Mr. Bernstein, and uh, and uh, Mr. Bernstein came to see some of Zalman's performances at the uh, at at the uh, Yiddish Alliance downtown downtown in New York City. So uh, uh, Zalman would know about that. Okay, so the film that people were, that was referenced is called Orchestra of Exiles. And, right, right, right. Um, and David, another David says that it's available on Amazon Prime. Um, as to a recording of this program, yes, there is gonna be a recording of this program and it will be distributed to those who participated. Um, are, if, are there any more questions? I'm opening it up just for another moment. It's getting late and we've been on for quite a long time. Um, okay, with that, I want to thank everybody for coming. And I also want to urge you to um, come next week as well to the Cantors Visit the Abu Judaya community. You can find it on the JTS website, the link to the, um, to the event. But what I really want to do is thank uh, Hazan David Tillman for this spectacular and um, 
uh, presentation that I think so many of us benefited so much from and looked at Bernstein's music and heard Bernstein's music in a, in a, in a just a new way. And we'll continue, I think, from today on to hear Bernstein very, very differently. Lots of thanks, lots of applause, and good night, everybody. And thank you for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.